we have a really special treat for you today. We have a special guest for you today. On Monday, Pastor Donnie was blessed to have a phone call from Bill Federer saying, hey, I'm going to be in town. I'd like to come visit you guys. And so, of course, we said yes. So I'd like to welcome our dear friend. He's a, a husband, a father, a lover of God, a historian. You've probably seen him on the radio. You've seen him on TV. He's famous, and he doesn't like a pulpit because he's going to just spit this all out from pure knowledge, which is amazing. So, church, welcome Bill Federer. Oh, bless you, Kobe, and you. you and Pastor Don are dear friends. I thank God for you. And I'm excited to be with you, Re Refresh Calvary. And uh, I get a chance to speak all around the country, to speak to huge crowds and churches, but I love speaking at church plants because it's such an exciting thing that you can be a part of this church growing and God is looking to pull people to get involved, right? Involved in every single area and uh, rather than going someplace where it's all done and you just sort of watch, this is one where you get a chance to be a part of something. I was thinking, you know, when they first came out with, uh, with like something like Bit Bitcoin and there was the ground floor level and a friend of mine had somebody say, yeah, you want to get in on it? He goes, ah, no, no. And then later it went to this, it exploded and the, the guy had made, become like a, a billionaire. And uh, this other friend was like, why didn't I get in when it was small? I could have been, well, this is sort of a spiritual thing. You get to get in on Refresh Calvary Chapel as it's growing, and you get to be a part of the great work that God's going to do right here. So um, I write history books and uh, try to make sense of history. Um, one of the uh, countries that I love is Israel. So I have a message today on the history of Israel. And uh, so it's sort of like, uh, uh, capsulizing the Bible story and then bringing it up to present. And I have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to pull that up on the screen here and um, go through uh, some of the, the history. So uh, big picture, um, I decided I was going to research every single century of recorded human history and find out that writing, as we know it, uh, was invented around three or 4,000 B.C., Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Today, that's Iraq. Now, we're not talking hand paintings on cave walls or anything. We're talking about an actual writing. And then you have Egyptian hieroglyphics were invented around 3000 BC. Um, uh, I'm sort of killing time until I see the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, it's not on this screen. And, um, but I, I can step forward if you, let me, maybe I'll step next to this. Um, so the, uh, so the most common form of government in world history is kings and, and they, uh, gang leaders, basically. And the, the kingdom keeps getting bigger until, uh, until ancient Israel was the first nation without a king. That first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. Um, and it worked for 400 years. Uh, and then they got to King Saul and they're back to kings. And they keep getting bigger until the king of England was the biggest. The sun never set on the British Empire. America's founders broke away and flipped it and made the king. So America founders actually look back to that pre-King Saul period of history. So, um, now we saw Sunday, last Sunday, uh, live updates, Iran launches first ever full-scale military assault on Israel. So last Sunday I spoke at a uh, candlelight church in um, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The pastor is still over in Israel because they don't have flights out, but I was filling the pulpit. It's like, okay, I got to talk about what's going on in Israel because your pastor's over there. So uh, 1800 BC is around the time that Abraham goes into the promised land. Um, and then uh, he has his descendants go down into Egypt for 400 years and they come out under Joshua. So around 1400 BC is when Joshua goes into the promised land and they have this Hebrew Republic, right? Until they get King Saul and then King David, and then David captures Jerusalem about 1,000 B.C. And uh, then in 722 B.C., the 10 northern tribes of Israel have backslidden, and Assyria comes and takes them captive to Assyria. The biggest city in the world was Nineveh, and that's where Jonah went to tell him to repent. Uh, but it was Nineveh in Assyria that took these 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted a couple more centuries until 587. 
B.C., and that's when Judah. Oh, thank you, Eric. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> and uh, so 587 B.C. is when Judah is taken captive to Babylon, and they're there for around 70 years, and the King Cyrus lets them come back, and they rebuild the temple. And so this is when you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and uh, they're coming back. Ezra is a priest, and he's teaching the law. So when they come back from Babylon, they do not do any more idol worship. And so Ezra would build platforms, and they would preach, and he would teach the law. And so this is where you get the Pharisees. The word Pharisee means student of the law. And out of all of planet Earth, they were worshiping God the closest to how God wanted to be worshiped. But over the centuries, they added on extra traditions. And so many extra traditions that when Jesus came up, they didn't recognize him. So um, the Cyrus of Persia lets the Jews go back and they rebuild the temple. And so Persia... Uh, is a big empire until it's conquered by Alexander the Great. And Alexander brings in Greek stuff, uh, Greek statues, Greek gymnasiums, Greek Olympics, all this Greek stuff, and uh, a lot of humanistic type stuff, a lot of um, sexual stuff. So the, um, the Greeks were into um, Gymnasiums, the word gym, G-Y-M, is Greek for naked, right? You have these bathhouses, you have the statues, right, without any clothes on them. And so why is this, why am I talking about this? Because when the Greeks took over this area of Persia with Alexander the Great, and then his general Seleucid get, gets control of Persia and the Holy Land, the Jews that were political wanted to butter up to the Greeks that were now in control. And these are the Sadducees. And they looked at the Pharisees as sort of, oh, those are those religious fanatics. And, you know, and so the, the, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. They, they didn't believe anything supernatural. They were just Jews buttering up to the Greeks that were the political power that was in control. So the Pharisees and Sadducees did not like each other. And you had the um, the. Greek general under Alexander, Seleucius, he starts this Seleucid kingdom, and he has this guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. He's the, the Syrian king, Greek-type king, and he wants to wipe out their religion, and so he makes them sacrifice pigs and all kinds of terrible stuff. The Jews drive him out. They cleanse the temple, and this is when they get Hanukkah where they light the candelabra in the temple, the seven golden candlesticks, and it stays lit for eight days, even though they had only enough oil for one day. So this is where the Hanukkah came from, was these Jews driving out these Greeks and Assyrians, and it worked. And the Jews got to have their own kingdom for a hundred years. And so you have the Romans, you know, getting bigger and bigger, and then the Greeks under Alexander, they're sort of over there, and Persia's sort of over there. And so you have this little bitty kingdom of, of, of Judah on its own for a, a, nearly a century, and it's called the Hasmonean dynasty. But what happens? The Sadducees and Pharisees start a civil war. They're killing each other. And the Sadducees controlled Jerusalem because they were the political ones. The Pharisees were out in the countryside and had all the little local synagogues. The word synagogue means meeting place. And that's where these Pharisee Bible teacher rabbis would teach everybody the Bible. And, and so you have the civil war going on inside of Judah, the Hasmonean kingdom. And what happens next? Pompey, the Roman general, and he is around the Black Sea, conquering an area called Cappadocia. Word gets to Pompey that there's a civil war going on in this Judea kingdom. And this Roman general says, great time to attack. This is actually military strategy. When you want to conquer a country, you want to get them to fight each other on the inside first, to weaken the kingdom. Uh, Karl Marx called it critical theory where you break a country into subgroups 
ethnically, economically, racially, religiously, and you call some victims and others oppressors, haves and have-nots, and you pit them against each other to have protests and riots and all kinds of violence. And then when the country gets weakened, everybody says, we need the government to come in with a strong power to restore order. And the government says, we've been waiting. And they come in and take away all your guns and your freedom and everything, and they set up a dictatorship. So um, this is how the British took over India. Uh, they'd come in uh, 1714, opened a trading post, turned into a trading fort, turned into them having guns, and they would give guns to one kingdom, guns to another kingdom, stir up animosity between the kingdoms. They'd fight and weaken each other, and the British would take over both kingdoms, and they would do this again and again and again until they took over all of India. I talk about this in my book called Socialism, but you have this idea of, it's, it's like introducing an autoimmune disease into the body politic. What's an autoimmune disease? It's where your own immune system starts attacking your own organs. you got a war going on inside of your body. And so this is going into a country, the body politic, and you get it to fight each other. The word devil is Greek, diabolos. It means to divide. So imagine being in heaven and somebody's sowing division. Well, it happened. Lucifer got a third of the angels to divide. They're cast out. Then he sows division in the garden with Adam blaming Eve and Cain killing Abel. And so how do you destroy a marriage? So division. How do you destroy a family? So division. How do you destroy a church? So division. How do you destroy a country? So division. Right? Anyway, um, so that's a whole other talk I get into in my book on socialism. But here's Pompey, the Roman general, and he gets news that there's division. In Judea, in Judah, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees fighting each other. And so Pompey comes and he conquers. And um, he actually goes into the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem. And he sees it with all of the glory and all the gold and the presence of the Lord. And he, he turns around, comes out, and tells his men, do not touch this place. And so these Roman soldiers are like, oh, gee, we can't, like, trash it. He goes, no, no, stay away. Because they're, and, and so the Jews liked Pompey. But, uh, but from that point on, Judea is not an independent kingdom. It is a Roman province. And then you have Herod, and then Jesus has his ministry, 30 to 33 AD. Jesus is crucified. Jesus rises from the dead. Thank God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then the Holy Spirit's poured out. And then the church grows. And um, uh, it, uh, I have this map here, and it has a, um, on my uh, computer, you can press a button and you can sort of see how it um, starts in Judea, and then it spreads, and it spreads, and it spreads. And you can see it's sort of the map growing, taking over the whole Roman Empire. Um, but immediately, the Christians were persecuted by, you know, Nero. And I thought to myself, you know, if I were going to start a movement, I would be like, give them a couple years without persecution, like a little greenhouse. Let it be protected. I, no, -uh. God says immediately the church has started. Boom, persecution. We're sort of moving in the direction of a one world anti-Christian government. Well, guess what? The church was born into a one world anti-Christian government, the Roman Empire, and we won. <laughs> so God's not afraid of that. Um, my attitude is that God has plan A and plan B. Plan A is he blesses us. We turn to him out of gratefulness. If that doesn't work, he sort of withholds the blessings. And we experience the consequences of our selfish decisions. And we turn to the Lord out of desperation. His goal is to have us turn to him. And there's an easy way and there's a hard way. <laughs> we, we should turn to him all the time. But uh, human nature is, it's usually a crisis that brings people to Christ. But uh, at least turn to him in our crises, right? So, um, so the church is born into a one world anti-Christian government, the Roman Empire. Nero is the emperor. He wants to do building projects in Rome. And so uh, the, there's a fire that gets started and historians are pretty well convinced that Nero set the fire. It clears out this poor area of Rome where he does his building projects of the Colosseum and the Circus Maximus. And, but heat is coming on to Nero, and so he wants to deflect. And he says, well, it's the Christians that started the fire. And he arrests Christians, wraps them in burlap. And if you see on this picture on the right, there's poles. He, he puts the Christians on poles dips him in tar, and then he's in the middle there in one of those little thrones. It's sort of hard to pick him out. And he's watching, and they set him on fire. They're Nero's torches. He's killing these Christians. So uh, then 
Nero sends his general Vespasian to attack Judah in 66 AD. And he's about to win, but Nero dies. And so Vespasian goes back to Rome to be the emperor. And there's two years of peace. But um, instead of the Jews getting their defenses around Jerusalem shored up, they divide Jerusalem into three or four different neighborhoods and they're fighting each other inside of the city of Jerusalem. And then Vespasian sends his son Titus and he destroys Jerusalem in 70 AD. And they kill about a million Jews. They kill them in the Colosseums. They spread them all around. And um, so the Jews are forbidden to come within sight of the city, but they live. They're still there. All the treasures from Jerusalem were taken to Rome and used to build the Colosseum. That's where they got the money for that. And, you know, whenever a nation does something bad against Israel, sort of coincidentally, something bad happens to that nation. And so after Rome destroys Jerusalem in 79 AD, a volcanic eruption, Mount Vesuvius blows up and it wipes out a whole huge area. And um, there's the mummified bodies from the ash. I went to uh, in school in Rome. I had a semester uh, semester in college in Rome. So we traveled all around Italy and we went to Pompeii and we saw these, these, uh, uh, it was a pretty immoral place. It was like the Las Vegas of the Mediterranean, but let's go to one guy. I want to talk about Hadrian. His, um, male lover dies off, off a yacht in the Nile river and he sort of gets bummed out and he sort of decides he's going to, uh, get rid of these Jews that are sort of organizing resistance movements. And so he sends a Roman legion to Israel to, it's called the Bar Kokhba revolt, Simon Bar Kokhba. And so he's getting this revolt going and Hadrian sends a Roman legion over there. The Jews wipe out the Roman legion, 12,000 Roman soldiers gone. Hadrian sends another Roman legion, the Hispania legion. It's destroyed and disbanded. He sends another one over there, the Fratenius legion. It's like gone. It's like, and so Hadrian decides he's going to send every Roman legion left to Israel. And they go city by city, village by village, and they destroy everything synagogues, you know, uh, church, anything. They just destroy and kill and wipe out. And Hadrian uh, executes all the rabbis. He burns every copy of the Torah because he's finally figured out it's their religion. It's that religion that keeps getting them wanting to rebel. So he wants to wipe out their religion. He uh, hunts down and kills every descendant of David. Because these Jews are saying, oh, the Messiah's got to be a descendant of David. And he's, uh, he said, okay, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to kill every descendant of David. Now, Jesus was the descendant of David, who is the king of kings and Lord of lords. So we really don't need any more descendants of David. But Hadrian made sure there would not be any more descendants of David. <laughs> Hadrian builds a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. So the temple was destroyed with Titus, but the mount is still there. It's a, the, and so he builds this temple to Jupiter. Hadrian renames Jerusalem Aelia Capitolina, and Aelia is Hadrian's family name. And then he renames Judea Syria Palestina. And so why? So I, I share all the story of Hadrian because of that last line. This is when Judea is called Palestine. That's where the name came from. Why are we calling it Palestine over there? It's Hadrian. He like wanted to wipe out Israel from memory. And um, so you have the Byzantine Empire takes over for a while and then Islam comes along and uh, Muhammad uh, conquers from uh, Arabia to conquers Jerusalem, conquers um, into Egypt. People forget Egypt was Christian for six centuries, evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel. Right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark was an evangelist, went to Egypt, and the, but it was Christian until the Muslims wiped it up. And then the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, which had been, uh, after 325 AD, a, a, a Christian city under Constantine. And then the Muslims conquered into Syria. Syria was the first country that was completely Christian, evangelized by Paul. The name Christian was first used in Syria. 
until Caliph Umar conquered it in 648 AD. And then they conquered into Armenia, which was Christian. And then they conquered North Africa. There used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa. Morocco, Algiers, Tunisia, Libya. It was all Christian. It was all Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian. St. Augustine of Hippo was from Carthage. Today, that's Tunisia. And then in the year 711, 80,000 Muslims invade Spain, conquer it in 10 years. They're stopped outside of Paris at the Battle of Tours. And then the Turks convert to Islam, and they conquer into what is today Turkey. All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation are wiped out by the Muslim Turks, right? Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, uh, Thyatira, um, Sardis, Pergamum, Laodicea, Philadelphia, all, they're all wiped out. And, um, and then you have the Ottoman Turks. And uh, they are at the gates of Vienna, and uh, Martin Luther starts the Reformation. Um, and the Turkish Empire goes on for 700 years. I'm skipping past some stuff. They fight with Russia. Uh, John Paul Jones, that helped with our revolution, went over to Russia and helped them to fight the Muslims, Ottoman Turks, on the Black Sea. Napoleon invades Egypt, right, in 798 or so. And then you have the Crimean War, where Russia and Turkey, the Ottoman Turks, are fighting. And Britain and France comes in on the side of the Turks and helps arm them and equip them to fight the Russians. It's called the Battle of Crimea. And the Russians lose. And the Russians have a territory called Alaska. And the British controlled Canada. And the Russians said, okay, we lost to the, the British and the French and the Turks. And so the British control Canada. The British might try to take Alaska. And the Russians just lost, so they don't have an army to defend it. And so Russia pulls a fast one and sells all of Alaska to America. And um, that's how we got Alaska, was the Crimean War. And um, so this Turkish Empire, um, is, it would have fallen apart had not the French and the British keep shoring them up. Um, but toward the end of the 1800s, it's called the Sick Man of Europe. And uh, you have... Uh, parts of it are being taken away by other countries. Mark Twain visits the Holy Land, the Ottoman Empire, and he says, Palestine is desolate, unlovely, rags, wretchedness, poverty, dirt, the signs and symbols that indicate the presence of Muslim rule. Um, Jerusalem is mournful, dreary, lifeless. I would not desire to live there. Muslims watch the Golden Gate with a jealous eye, an anxious one, for they have an honored tradition that when it falls, Islamism will fall, and with it, the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Turks were not in a hurry to make the Christians they conquered become Muslim because it was the Christian minorities that paid the taxes. And they were called Dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M -I, and they had to ransom your life once a year with a jizya tax. You bring this money, and if you don't have enough money to pay it, guess what? They can sell you and your wife and kids into slavery. And so... Um, Anyway, here's Mark Twain. He says, renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur. The wonderful temple, which was the pride and glory of Israel, is gone. The Ottoman crescent is lifted above the spot where, on that most memorable day in the annals of the world, they reared the Holy Cross. And um, so you have the Ottoman Empire's the green, and it used to cover the whole area, but now France has Algiers, right? And you have uh, Spain taking parts of... Um, uh, Morocco, and, and then you have Italy taking parts of Libya. Britain has uh, Egypt. Uh, the French build the Suez Canal, but then the British take it over in 1882. And then the British have Khartoum in Sudan. And then Russia takes a little bit. And, um, and then the British are over in Persia. So the Ottoman Empire, if left on its own, it would have, it would have fallen apart. It would have dissolved. And countries like Greece breaks away. And then Romania and Bulgaria and Albania, and all these countries are breaking away from this Ottoman Empire. And um, then something happens. Uh, Armenia wants to break away. And the Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, said no more countries can break away. And he kills hundreds of thousands of Armenian Christians in the late 1800s. And um, then you have oil. Now, where did oil come from in the 1800s? Anybody have an idea? Where did oil come from in the 1800s? Wales. 
Moby Dick. Right? They'd chase these whales and capture them and then boil down their blubber and then they'd use it in whale oil lamps. And the poor things were going to extinction until oil was discovered coming out of the ground in 1859 with the Drake oil well in Pennsylvania and then in Oklahoma and then in the Middle East. And so Britain industrializes and Winston Churchill turns the British Navy from coal to oil. So the British now have a need for oil. There's only one oil well in all of Britain. It's in the Sherwood Forest of all places. <laughs> and so the British make a deal with Persia, Iran, for oil. And they form the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. You know it better as BP, right? British Petroleum. So here they are taking down the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company sign and putting up the British Petroleum sign. And so Britain and Iran are teamed up for oil. But now Germany industrializes. Kaiser Wilhelm II, but Germany doesn't have any oil well, so they make a deal with the Ottoman Turkish Empire. It's called the Berlin Baghdad Railroad. And um, the Germans are wanting to get ready for World War I. And they do an agreement with Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, with Sultan Abdul Hamid II of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. It's a oil for guns agreement. Germany will supply these guns to the Turks if the Turks supply oil to the Germans. And um, the movie The Promise, Christian Bale starred in it, and it goes through this period of the Turks, the sick man of Europe, countries are breaking away, and they're sort of tolerant toward the Armenians, and then the Germans show up, and they whip the Turks into this jihad frenzy that kills the Armenians again, and... Um, so, half, so World War I starts, and half of World War I was in the Middle East. And uh, you have uh, Win Woodrow Wilson tries to get America to come to the Armenians' rescue. Uh, we don't, and so they kill another million Armenians. And, um, and so World War I ends, and they take the map of Europe and redraw it. No more Austro-Hungarian Empire, no more, you know, and they, they create new brand new countries like Yugoslavia was a, was a created country after World War I. Well, they do the same thing in the Middle East. They take the map of the Ottoman Empire and they redraw the lines. And um, you have uh, Italy once apart, uh, British controlled, you know, the uh, Middle East, which... Uh, became the country of Iraq and later Jordan and then Israel. France takes control of Syria and then Russia takes a little control. And so they redrew the map of Europe. They redrew the map of the Middle East. Um, now, two people I want to talk about. One, during the war, the British were running out of explosives. And there's a guy named Chaim Wiseman. He's a Jew from Russia. Remember the fiddler on the roof, the Jews leaving Russia? And so Chaim Wiseman is a chemist and he comes to the British military rescue because he comes up with a bacterial fermentation process to make acetone, takes these breweries, turns them into making this. And this is a chemical needed to make explosives. And so now the British have lots of explosives after the war. They want to thank him, make him a sir or a knight or give him an estate. And he goes, I'd really like a homeland for the Jewish people. And so they issued the Balfour Declaration, giving the Jews a huge swath of land that used to be part of the Ottoman Empire that the British got after the, the Turks and the Germans lost World War I. And so here is uh, the letter. It says, you know, um, His Majesty's government would favor establishment in Palestine, the national home for the Jewish people. Now, where did the idea of Jews going back to the Holy Land come from? It came from Christians. In the early 1800s is the second great awakening revival. And you had tent preachers, revival meetings, you had um, missionary movements, and there's a group of Christians that are called millennialists because they finally found out in the Bible that Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign for a thousand years. All right. Uh, the same way Jesus, the, Jesus ascends into heaven after the day of Pentecost. And uh, the angels say, why stand ye looking up into heaven? The same Jesus that you saw is going to come back in like manner. Right. Um, and he doesn't say when, because we're always, been, he wants us to be expectant. And, um, uh, but, uh, 
But these Christians noticed that the Jews are supposed to be back in the Holy Land for a lot of these prophecies to be fulfilled. And so the Christians go to the Jews and say, you need to think about going back. And so here is Jeffrey Alderman, Jewish Chronicle, November 8, 2012, writes, the Balfour Declaration was born out of religious sentiment. Arthur Balfour was a Christian mystic who believed that the Almighty had chosen him to be an instrument of the divine will, the purpose of which was to restore the Jews to their ancient homeland, perhaps as a precursor to the second coming of the Messiah. The declaration, the Balfour Declaration, was thus intended to assist in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. This appealed to Lloyd George, the prime minister of Britain, believing in the prophecies of the Bible he knew inside and out. So it was Christians that came up with the idea. So why are we as Christians attached to Israel and care about what's going on over there? Because we are so partly responsible for it even existing. And then another is um, the um, uh, Christians that um, were in England. So Anita Shapira writes Israel a History, published in 2014. The idea of the Jews returning to their ancient homeland as the first step to world redemption seems to have originated among a specific group of evangelical English Protestants that flourished in England in the 1840s. They passed this notion on to Jewish circles. It was Christians that came up with the idea of going there, telling you you didn't think about going back. And so this thought is called Zionism because that's what they call that hill in Jerusalem where the temple, they call it Mount Zion. And, uh, and Theodore Herzl was the Jewish pioneer that took it from a theory to actually, let's make this thing happen. And so Theodore Herzl organized the first Zionist Congress in 1897 in Switzerland. And it was a big deal. Lots of people came. You know who came? Henry Dunant the founder of the International Red Cross. He was a Christian. He ran the YMCA in the Young Men's Christian Association in Geneva, Switzerland. And Henry Dunant was the first recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. And so he's a Christian supporting the Jews going back. And um, so Lord Balfour wrote, my personal hope is that Jews will make good in Palestine and eventually found a Jewish state. It is up to them now. We have given them their great opportunity. And now Lord Balfour's picture was defaced just over a month ago, and uh, it says, uh, Reuters, March 8th, 2024, activist slashes painting of British author of Jewish Homeland Declaration. So the Jews were given this land by the Balfour Declaration. It goes from the Mediterranean Sea, Syria, Iraq, Arabia, Egypt. It's the same boundaries that God promised Moses that the Jews would have way back, right, in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy and so forth. And, um, but somebody threw a monkey wrench in the works. His name was Lawrence of Arabia. So we talked about the person of Chaim Wiseman, but now we're going to talk about Lawrence of Arabia. Who was he? He was a lieutenant in Cairo, Egypt, sent on an assignment. Go meet with the Arabs and see if the Arab Muslims will help the British defeat the Turkish Muslims. So we got different kind of Muslims going on here, right? So Arabia was more tribal. It was a lot of desert, a little un unorganized. And so Lawrence of Arabia meets with the uh, Sharif and Amir of Mecca. And he tries to say, will you help the British defeat the Turkish Muslims? And so um, the uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia doesn't just report back. He takes it upon himself to lie to the Arabs and tell them, if you help the British defeat the Turks, you will get all the land in the Middle East. And he admitted that he lied in his book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, 1922. Had I been an honest advisor to the Arabs, I would have advised them to go home and not risk their, risk their lives fighting for such stuff. I risk the fraud on my conviction that Arab help was necessary to our cheap and speedy victory in the East, and that better we win and break our word than lose. For being a successful trickster, and to prevent this unpleasantness from arising, I began in my reports to conceal the true stories of things. So Lawrence of Arabia is lying. I was um, uh, just uh, yesterday had lunch with, with Gordon Robertson, and he was talking about when Winston Churchill 
came to Jerusalem with Lawrence of Arabia, all the Arabs were shouting. And Winston Churchill thought they were shouting for the British there. They, they were saying, kill the Jews. They said Lawrence of Arabia refused to interpret that. Winston Churchill, what are they saying? What are they saying? So, oh, they're just happy you're here. No, they're saying kill the Jews. <laughs> so here's Lawrence of Arabia lying and hiding, calling himself a trickster, right? And um, so the problem this started was the same plot of land that was promised to the Jews by Lord Balfour, this huge area that was the same land that God told Moses that they would have. Um, and they were given it because Chaim Wiseman, the Jewish chemist, came up with making acetone during World War I to help the British. And, and so, uh, but because of Lawrence of Arabia, the, the same land's promised to the Arabs. So the same land promised to two different groups, right? The land's promised to the Jews, and then it, un, unauthorized, it's promised to the Arabs. So the Shamir and uh, uh, Amir, uh, the Sharif and Amir of Mecca, Sharif and Amir of Mecca, is Hussein ibn Ali al-Hashimi. I'll just call him al-Hashimi. Um, but he's the one that Lawrence of Arabia worked with to start this great Arab revolution, to get the Arabs to break away from the Turkish Ottoman Empire. And, and al-Hashimi called himself the last caliph of Islam. So the supreme leader in Islam is called the Caliph, and now the Ottoman Empire is gone. He takes the title. And, um, and he's actually a, a fairly moderate guy. And because uh, in Mecca, in uh, Arabia is Mecca. And once in a person's life that's a faithful Muslim, they take a pilgrimage to Mecca called the Hajj. And uh, the Sharif of Mecca, Al Hashimi, he's like, okay. Muslims are coming from around the world. We need to sort of get along. So he's sort of a moderate guy. He's called a modernist, and he's relatively tolerant. And he not, not just tolerates all the different flavors of Muslims. He tolerates Jews. He tolerates Christians. And so he's a relatively tolerant guy. Worked with the British to defeat the Turks. And so he writes this during the Armenian genocide by the Turks. The Sharif decreed uh, Protect and take care of everyone from the Jacobite Armenian Christian community living in your territories. Defend them as you would defend yourselves. They are protected people of the Muslims. And um, so the British take a part of the old Ottoman Empire and they gave it to the Jews. They take another part of the old Ottoman Empire and they call it Iraq. And they take Al Hashimi's son and make him king of Iraq. And his name's Fazl. And so. Uh, in the movie Lawrence of Arabia, Fazl is played by Alec Guinness. And you know Alec Guinness because he was also Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was interesting. Um, <laughs> so here's Fazl, king of Iraq, and he's son of the Shamir and, um, of Mecca, al Hashimi. But Fazl gets along with the Jews. Here's a picture of Fazl, king of Iraq, with Chaim Wiseman, the Jew that made the acetone to help the British. And, and, and as a result, he's given the Balfour Declaration. And so here is Fazl, and he says, We feel that the Arabs and Jews are cousins, and having suffered similar oppressions at hands strong, uh, of power stronger than themselves, we look with the deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. We will wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. And so here he's welcoming the Jews back. And then here's the Sharif of Mecca. He says, the resources of the country are still virgin soil and will be developed by the Jewish immigrants that the country is for its original sons, for all their differences, a sacred and beloved homeland. He's okay with the Jews coming back. But there's a problem. France wants Syria. And France carves out Lebanon as a Christian enclave country. And, um, but the French, instead of just viewing it as a protectorate, like America viewed the Philippines as a protectorate for a while, France comes in with its armies and drives out Fossil and drives out uh, the people that supported Fossil. And Fossil thought he was going to get Iraq and Syria based on Lawrence of Arabia's unauthorized promise. And so it's going to start another war. And we just got through World War I and the... Uh, brother of Fazl is Abdullah, and he's organizing these Arabs to fight the French, and Winston Churchill steps in. And he says, um, 
we don't want another war. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the land we gave the Jews and take two thirds of it away from the Jews and create a brand new country called Jordan. And we're going to take Abdullah, the brother of Fazl and another son of the Al Hashimi, the, the uh, Sharif of Mecca, and we're going to make him the king of Jordan. And so um, here is Winston Churchill with Abdullah saying, you know, okay, I'll give you your own country. You're going to be the king. Uh, don't start a war with France over Syria. And so Winston Churchill was known for sipping brandy at his lunch. And um, the story that Winston Churchill shared was that he was um, having lunch in 1921 in Cairo and uh, sipping a little bit on brandy and on a napkin. He draws out the borders of this brand new country he's creating called Jordan. And so it says um, Churchill, known for drinking with his meal, explained in 1921 how he drew the map of the Middle East on a napkin at lunch with one stroke of a pen one Sunday afternoon in Cairo. So he just right. So he's created this country called Jordan. Years later, Churchill addressed the House of Commons. He says the Emir Abdullah is in Transjordan, where I put him one Sunday afternoon at Jerusalem. And so Churchill's like, oh, I'm just going to, yeah, I, I got an answer. I'll take away the land from the Jews. Great, there's another country called Jordan. I'll make Abdullah the, the king. And there's Churchill with Abdullah. So we got Fazl, the, king, the, um, uh, the son of the emir of Mecca, who worked with Lawrence of Arabia to defeat the Turkish Muslims. And then his brother, Abdullah, is uh, the son of the Al Hashimi there in Mecca. And uh, Abdullah is a relatively moderate guy. He's a Hashemite. That's the family that Muhammad was from. And, but Abdullah writes this as Arabs see the Jews, 1948. No people on earth have been less anti Semitic than the Arabs. The persecution of the Jews has been confined almost entirely to Christian nations of the West right? The Middle Ages and so forth. Uh, the Jews themselves will admit that never since the great dispersion, he admits the Jews had been there and they were dispersed. Did Jews develop so freely and reach such importance as in Spain when it was an Arab possession, right? So the Muslims controlled Spain for 700 years and the Jews were treated fairly nicely there. Um, with very minor exceptions, Jews have lived for many centuries in the Middle East in complete peace and friendliness with their Arab neighbors. Well, what happened? How did we go from, um, uh, by the way, Turkey, it moderates with a leader named Ataturk and he's secular. And he says, we want to separate ourselves from this fundamental Muslim past. And so you have, uh, this is an interesting map. So you got Turkey is no longer the Ottoman Empire. It's called the Republic of Turkey. There's the French that control Syria. There's Lebanon. There's the British mandate. And there's Iraq. And um, so here's Ataturk with Fazl. And there's another picture of Ataturk with Fazl. Notice how they're dressed. They're dressed in British clothes. The world is looking. The Ottoman Empire that had been there for 700 years is gone. The Muslims said the future is the West. We want to westernize ourselves. And um, here's Ataturk with the Reza Shah Pavlavi in Iran. And he's wanting to secularize Iran, right? Give women an education, <laughs> allow them to wear dresses if they want. Here's Ataturk with um, uh, the king of Afghanistan. And he's wanting to let women be able to walk freely uh, without having to wear burqas and having an education. And the Ataturk said he is a weak ruler who needs religion to uphold his government. Ataturk said even before accepting the religion of the Arabs, the Turks were a great nation. Uh, Mohammedism was based on Arab nationalism above all nationalities. The purpose of the religion founded by Muhammad over all nations was to drag them into including Arab national politics. It might have suited tribes in the desert. It is no good for a modern progressive state. So here, the head of Turkey is wanting to become more West. Everybody's wanting to become more Westernized. Kennedy even honors Ataturk. And, uh, and so Iran becomes more secular, and it's led by the Shah. And there he is with Eisenhower, with Truman, with uh, Kennedy, and his wife with Jacqueline. And... Um, and they have discos in Iran, right? Uh, here's Iran in the 1970s. It looks like Berkeley, California. Um, here you have, um, you know, girls with skirts going to college. Here's Afghanistan. Girls with skirts going to class because it's secular. The women have freedom. Here's beauty pageants in Syria. 
and, uh, and there's Fouad in Egypt, and he's more moderate, but he's overthrown um, with a sort of a CIA type thing. But they put in Gamal Nasser, and um, he wants to have freedom in Egypt. Here's women wearing stylish dresses, and uh, here's Cairo. The beaches in Cairo look like, you know, the beach boys in Southern California. <laughs> it's like, whoa, the whole world's moving in this Western secular direction. Everybody's happy. And um, there's Gamal Nasser. Notice his whole family's dressed in Western clothes. And um, he said, I met with the head of the Muslim Brotherhood and sat with me, made his request. What did he request? To make wearing the hijab mandatory in Egypt and demand every woman walking the streets wear a Tarha scarf. I told him, my opinion is that every person in his own house decides for himself the rules. He replied, no, as the leader, you are responsible. I told him, sir, you have a daughter in the School of Medicine. She's not wearing a Tarha. If you are unable to make one girl who's your daughter wear the Tarha, you want me to put a Tarha on 10 million women myself? And so what happened? How do we go from this Western world after World War I, after World War II, wanting to become more Westernized to what we have today? Well, remember this guy? the Sharif of Mecca, and he's relatively tolerant. Well, he fudged on a, the British were wanting to pressure him to do more treaties, and he did, said no. And the British said, you know what? We're just going to stand back and let you get overthrown by the Saud family. And this is when Arabia became Saudi Arabia. And the Saud family was Wahhabi. They were this very violent, cutting off arms and legs and harems and all kinds of stuff, religion. So in 1924, this Sharif of Mecca is driven out. He uh, uh, dies and his body's buried on the Temple Mount. Right? They, they have the, you know, the al Aska Mosque, but over on the side they have some crypts and stuff and he's buried there. And um, anyway, Lawrence of Arabia talks about the Sauds, the Wahhabis. Because Wahhabis, followers of a fanatic Muslim heresy, had imposed their strict rules. Everything was forcibly pious, forcibly puritanical. Um, William McCants, Brookings Institute. Saudis promote a very toxic form of Islam that draws sharp lines between small number of true believers and everyone else Muslim and non-Muslim. In other words, the Wahhabi version of Islam, they're just as happy to kill a moderate Muslim as they are to kill an infidel. And so what happens? You have these leaders that want to become more westernized, and now the Wahhabis want to assassinate them for becoming too westernized. And um, so uh, we love the person, we just don't like this Wahhabi teaching. So here's Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud, lots of wives, 45 kids. He's got this fundamentalist Islam. And now, since he controls Arabia, controls Mecca, these Muslims coming on their Hajj pilgrimage once in their life, they go to Mecca and they get infected with Wahhabism. From 1924 on, go back to their country, spreading this Wahhabism version of Islam. But the big deal was oil was discovered in Saudi Arabia in 1938 by Standard Oil Company, John D. Rockefeller. And now they can export their Wahhabism with money and bribe politicians in the West and um, so you have the Rockefellers. Um, and so now Saudi Arabia goes from the poorest Muslim country to the richest, becomes a magnet for fundamentalism, and they're spending, spending billions of dollars when we were buy the oil from them where they're spreading Wahhabism and buying politicians. And so um, it's called the Aramco, the Arab Ara American Oil Company. And uh, there they have all their gold cars. And um, so the two points is Wahhabism is the fountain of all terrorist groups. Every terrorist group that you read about in the news goes back ideologically to Wahhabism, to the Sauds. Uh, Muslim Brotherhood, PLO, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, Boko Haram, Hezbollah, Al-Shabaab, Egyptian Islamic Jihad, and then you have Saudi oil spreading all that. And so um, Palestine used to be the homeland for the Jews. That word came from uh, Hadrian. Uh, but here's in the 1920s, the United Palestine Appeal, land of Jewish immigration and colonization help the wanderer back to his own soil. Franklin Roosevelt writes to Stephen Wise, a rabbi who's the head of the United Palestine Appeal. And he says um, to the National Conference for Palestine, um, the American people have watched with sympathetic interest the effort of the Jews to renew in Palestine the ties to their ancient homeland, and reestablish the Jewish culture in the place where for centuries it flourished. And so everybody referred to Palestine as the homeland for the Jews. And um, so now the British, they pressured 
the Sharif of Mecca, well, they flip. And in 1922, they issue the white papers and they begin to limit Jewish immigration into this British uh, area, the British mandate. And, uh, but 1928, the Muslim Brotherhood has started. It takes the Wahhabi teaching and puts it into a tactical organization to make it happen. It was formed by six employees of the British-run Suez Canal Company. Suez Canal was built by the French. The British took it over in 1882. And so this Muslim Brotherhood, again, it takes that, that teaching ideology and it puts it into these terrorist groups. And the two main features of this Muslim Brotherhood is infiltrating and then doing assassinations based on the two cities Muhammad lived in. Muhammad was in Mecca. He was a religious leader. Muhammad was in Medina. He becomes a political and a military leader. And so the Muslim Brotherhood says, infiltrate all of these countries and pretend like you're just a religious Muslim. But when you get the signal, you flip and do terrorist attacks and assassinations. And so um, they team up with this Mufti of Jerusalem who worked with Hitler and um, to wipe out Jews. And, um, uh, and then Eisen, excuse me, uh, FDR does an agreement with the Saud family. It's a oil for guns agreement. The Saudi Arabia will give oil to America and America will put a military base in Saudi Arabia, right, to defend the, the, the Sauds. And um, so Franklin Roosevelt dies and Harry S. Truman becomes president. And the British were so tired of this Arab-Israeli conflict that once Harry S. Truman helped form the United Nations, the British said, okay, May 1st, we pick, we're going to pick a date. The date is, is May 15th of 1948. British is going to surrender its mandate to the Middle East. We're going to surrender to the United Nations. It's your problem now. We can finally be rid of it. And, uh, and so now there's a deadline, right? May 15th, 1948. And uh, the surrounding countries are planning on taking this British mandate away from the Jews. And America was ignoring the situation. And, and Chaim Wiseman, the Jewish leader that created the acetone, that got the Balfour Declaration, that created the British mandate, Chaim Wiseman uh, goes to Washington, D.C. The president's Truman. He doesn't have time for him. And Harry S. Truman, when he was in World War I, had a buddy named Eddie Jacobson, who was Jewish. They actually ran a PX together. After the war, they, they run a haberdashery, a men's clothing store together in Kansas City, Missouri. You can still go there. It's got the little plaque on the wall. This is where Harry S. Truman and Eddie Jacobson ran their men's clothing store. Well, Harry S. Truman runs for politics, becomes president. And so here, Eddie Jacobson gives a phone call. Uh, Mr. President, Harry, old friend, hey, uh, Hein Weissman, he, he's traveled all halfway around the world uh, just to meet with you. C can you carve out a few minutes just to meet with him? And Harry S. Truman says, okay. Harry S. Truman meets him and all of a sudden realizes that he has an opportunity for the first time in 2,000 years to recognize the Jewish nation again. And Harry S. Truman's a Christian, right? And, um, and so uh, Israel, May 15th, 1948, is its own nation because Harry S. Truman, who helped form the United Nations, is saying America is going to recognize it. And, um, and so here's the 1948 Democrat Party platform. President Truman, by granting immediate recognition to Israel, led the world in extending welcome to a people of long sought freedom. We pledge full recognition to the state of Israel. We affirm the state of Israel right to self-defense. Immediately, the Arab countries surround and attack it. In 1948-49, uh, the um, Abdullah was um, given control of Jerusalem uh, after that war. Uh, Ralph Bunch, the first African-American to win the Nobel Peace Prize, negotiated the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict in 1950. And, uh, but Abdullah is assassinated by these Muslim Brotherhood people. Right? He was sort of friendly to the Jews. And um, so he's there in Jerusalem, the al Aska Mosque, and some of these Muslim Brotherhood people, they had infiltrated, pretend like they were nice, and then all of a sudden they assassinate him. And um, Einstein was going to be the next president, but he was ill and he said no. Um, and then you have the Muslim Brotherhood theology is influencing uh, uh, Turkey 
and they do a pogrom where they kill a lot of Greek Orthodox Christians uh, in the 1950s and drive them out. And then um, Nasser in Egypt takes the Suez Canal away from the British, blocks Jewish ships, and Israel and the British and French recapture the Sinai Peninsula, recapture the Suez Canal, and Eisenhower tells the Jews, if you give up the Sinai Peninsula, you'll have peace, land for peace. Well, they, the Jews gave up the Sinai Peninsula and they did not get peace. Then Russia comes in and they, have, they do something called critical race theory. And so after World War II, they don't like countries being free from the Soviet Union, so they would come into countries, identify all the groups, ethnically, Bosnians, Croats, Serbs, religiously, Sunni, Shia, Orthodox, and break a country into groups and pit them against each other. Remember that critical theory? And, and so autoimmune disease. So the, they would start the FARC in Colombia, uh, the, the, you know, with Che Guevara and help Castro take over Cuba. And, well, the KGB starts the PLO. The Palestinian liberation. Anytime you see something with liberation in the name, that's KGB. So the, the Palestinian Liberation Organization is started. And so now you see a mixing together with this Wahhabi teaching and all these terrorist groups together with Russian critical race theory tactics are going into sow division. So the PLO was created to sow division so that you would, the Russians could take over that area. And there's Yasser Arafat with Castro. And here's uh, you know, Brezhnev and, or Khrushchev with um, uh, Castro and Che Guevara and... Um, so, uh, you have another Muslim Brotherhood person, Sayyid Khatab, and he tries to assassinate Nasser in Egypt, and he influences Ayatollah Khomeini, al-Zawahiri, and Osama bin Laden, and all these other groups. And then we have the Jews, Six-Day War. The Jews win, take back Jerusalem, and even control the Temple Mount. They put the Jewish flag on top of the Temple and they said, oh, land for peace. Hurry up and give back the Temple Mount. You'll have peace. Well, that didn't work. And then you have Golda Meir, the woman prime minister of Israel. Uh, she grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But then she goes to uh, Israel and she becomes the leader. And uh, she writes this in 1969. There was no such thing as Palestinians. When was there an independent Palestinian people with a Palestinian state? It was either southern Syria, part of the Ottoman Empire, before the First World War, and then it was Jordan, because of Winston Churchill's napkin thing, right? It was not as though there was a Palestinian people in Palestine considering itself a Palestinian people, and we came and threw them out and took their country from them. They did not exist. It wasn't until the PLO was started by the KGB did you have people calling themselves Palestinians. Um, and... Um, so then these Muslim Brotherhood type people assassinate Jews at the Olympics in 1972. They do the war in 1973. The Jews survive. They take back the Sinai Peninsula. But Jimmy Carter talks them into giving it back to the, uh, Egypt at the Camp David Accords. So this is the Camp David Accords. The, the Egyptian leader, Anwar Sadat, makes a treaty with the Jewish leader, Menachem Begin. And everybody in the world is happy. The both of them get the Nobel Peace Prize. Billy Graham honors Anwar Sadat. Pat Robertson honors Anwar Sadat. We finally have the Arabs and the Jews becoming friends. But the Muslim Brotherhood people infiltrated the Egyptian military and they're having a parade and the military stops in front of the bandstands, lowers their machine guns, and they kill Anwar Sadat. And so you have um, Iran. It had the Shah who loved America. I met his son. I went to school with some Iranian kids. They had American flags on their dorm room wall. And, and um, anyway, Jimmy Carter pulls the rug out from the Shah and lets the Ayatollah take over Iran. So today, Iran's in the news. Whenever you see Iran in the news shooting missiles at Jews, Iran's funneling money to Hezbollah management, just think Jimmy Carter. Thank you, Jimmy Carter. And um, so uh, they start... Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the Muslims blow up our U.S. Marine barracks, um, and Reagan withdraws, and that just feeds them because they have a concept when your enemy's strong, retreat, when your enemy's weak, attack. Afghanistan. So we always think of checkers, two sides. It's really more Chinese checkers. There's multiple sides. And so uh, the Soviet Union is the big threat, 
And so the U.S. arms and trains Muslim Wahhabi type people in Afghanistan to fight the Russians. It's called the Afghan Soviet War. And so our U.S. CIA is arming and training the Taliban. It's called Operation Cyclone. It's the biggest CIA covert operation ever. What's covert means? That means they're doing it, but you don't know about it. <laughs> and so uh, Tom Hanks did a movie on it called Charlie Wilson's War. Uh, Sylvester Stallone did a movie on it called Rambo 3. And it's the U.S. CIA arming and training the Taliban. Well, one of those Taliban people was Osama bin Laden. And, um, and then since Jimmy Carter abandoned Iran to the Ayatollah, there's an Iran-Iraq war, and we don't want Iran to win. So under Reagan, we are arming and training Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis to fight Iran. We don't want Iran to win. And then uh, there's a flip that takes place under the New World Order push. Um, then we have Bill Clinton and the Bosnian War, and Bill Clinton is funneling arms through Iran to the Bosnian Muslims to fight the Serbian Christians. And then we get rid of Saddam, who Saddam was a moderate. He had six palaces that were staffed by Chaldean Christians because he knew that the Muslims would smile at the daytime and then kill them at night. So he knew Christians wouldn't do that. I talked to uh, one of the Chaldean Christian generals that Saddam had. And I'm like, you're a Christian. How could you be in Saddam's army? He goes, they didn't necessarily like us, but they trusted us. And they knew we wouldn't backstab them because of our Christian beliefs. And so, um, so, so Saddam sort of looked at these Chaldean Christian minorities as his responsibility to take care of them. But America comes in, gets rid of Saddam, and we disassemble their entire country. Anybody that studies military, if it's a hierarchical country, you just get rid of the king and you put in your guy. In the Bible, there's a king... Uh, Josiah, he dies, his, his one son, Jehoahaz, I think is his name. Um, Egypt comes in and just gets rid of him and puts in another king named, you know, Jehoiakim. But it leaves the whole structure in place. Um, you don't come in and disassemble. So when we went into Iraq, we disassembled. We told everybody to go home. And then we were like going to rebuild their entire nation. And what happens? ISIS comes out of it. So here's David Kilcullen uh, said, there, there undeniably would be no ISIS if we had not invaded Iraq. And um, so then we have Obama and he lets these Taliban leaders go back and then they, they do a genocide killing the Christians in the Middle East. And um, here's the Los Angeles Times in Syria, militias armed by the Pentagon fight those armed by the CIA. <laughs> We're like arming and training all these terrorist groups. Um, and then we have uh, the guns from Benghazi being used to try to take out the, uh, the Assad in Syria and Hillary Clinton doing gun running. It got so bad that, that Tulsi Gabbard introduces a bill, Stop Arming Terrorists Act. <laughs> it's like she went over there. It's like, why does America keep arming the terrorists? And um, so Trump gets in and he stops the arming of the terrorists. And uh, Trump recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And then Biden gets in. And what does he do? He withdraws from Afghanistan and all the pro-America people that we've spent 20 years wanting to get rid of the Taliban put in place, he get, they all get abandoned and killed. The Taliban takes, nobody believes the, the official story that the Taliban could surprise us and take over. Um, I mean, we were arming and training them for 20 years. I had an Uber driver from, from Afghanistan and he said, I was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot trained by the Americans. We were fighting with the Americans, getting the Taliban. And he says, we could have taken the Taliban out that quick. There's just a thousand of them on motorcycles. He said, but we got an order to stand down. And he goes, all my friends landed their helicopters in Tajikistan because they knew if they landed in Afghanistan, they'd be killed. He said, I had to hide for 10 days. Finally contacted my trainer in America and he pulled some strings to get me out. And, um, but he says, now I'm making bread at Panera and driving Ubers. And anyway, so... Chinese planes were flying into Afghanistan the same time we were evacuating people out. And so rare earth metals for, for batteries now belongs to China because of Biden. Anyway, but he leaves weapons, $85 billion worth of weapons. And here's a report. Weapons, U.S. weapons from Afghanistan ended up with the Palestinian groups operated in Gaza to be shot against Israel. We have given $100 billion to Iran since this current administration has been in. And um, so there's the Biden administration, Iran, billions in new sanction relief. 
A Wall Street Journal article, Biden keeps the billions flowing to Iran. And, uh, and then we see them infiltrating drug gangs in Latin and South America. And uh, I have a Hezbollah chapter in Venezuela, and they're coming up the southern border. And they're being bussed by our government to cities all around America. And the thought is, gee, are they going to do that Muslim Brotherhood thing where they're sort of hiding? And then when they give a signal, start doing terrorist attacks. And, um, and then there's little Israel, 9 million people surrounded by 400 million Muslims. Now, granted, most of the Muslims would be happy just to live their lives and actually to become more westernized so they could wear you know, not clothes and dress. You know. If America would just, in the, in the West, would stop propping up the, the, the violent Wahhabi versions of them. And, um, and then we're back to last week, where Iran fires through 300 drones. And um, now, I interviewed a guy years ago. I had a radio program. Um, and he was the son of the founder of Hamas, named uh, Mossab Hassan Youssef. He grew up in Palestine. His dad was the founder of Hamas. And they were killing Jews. And he, he noticed that Hamas would suspect somebody of working together with the Jews and would torture them to death. And they were Mossab's friends. And he goes, I knew they weren't working with the Jews, but he saw them being tortured to death. And he says, if this is the way Hamas works before they're in control of everything, what's going to happen when they are in control? So for 10 years, from 1997 to 2007, uh, Yusef was secretly warning the Jews of terrorist attacks and saved their lives. He eventually became a Christian, escaped to America. And he did a CBN interview, 2010. My problem is with the God of the Quran. If we compare his personality to the God of the Bible, we will find the difference. From their fruits, we know them. From the fruits of the God of the Quran is terrorism, beating women, killing children. He's talking about the Wahhabism. My transformation took six years of study. It was not overnight. I had to study Christianity and other religions. I considered at some point not to believe in any religion. The only path I found peace, which was good for me and good for all mankind, was Jesus Christ. You know, I want to uh, end with uh, the gospel. And um, have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of don't want to be around the person you've sinned against, right? And um, let's see here, I have a book I want to and just leave it on this one slide here. Um, so uh, if you've sinned against somebody, you, you don't want to be around the person you've sinned. Let's say you're talking about somebody behind their back and you're joking about them, making fun of them, and you look up and there's that very person walking towards you. Question, are you drawn to want to go over to that person? Or are you like, I'm embarrassed. I was just talking bad about him. Uh, I, I want to... You, slip out the back, right? Your own conscience wants you to avoid being around the person that you've talked bad against. So when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they wanted to hide. God still wanted to walk with them in the garden, but they wanted to get away. It's like two magnets that are touching and one of the magnets turns. The first one still wants to touch, but the second one wants to get away. So it's not so much that God sends people to hell. It's once people sin against God. It's their own conscience that makes them want to avoid God, avoid church, avoid being around for a day, a week, a month, a lifetime. So Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God, and then they said, we blew it. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God again. They put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions. Man coming up with man's idea how to make man acceptable to God. Hey, let's see, how can we do it? Did Adam and Eve's fig leaves make them acceptable to God? No. And then we read this little line, and God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. We read it really fast, but if you think of it, how do you make a coat of skin? Kill an animal. Something has to die. You think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? And they witnessed the first death ever, right? Creation just happened, according to the Bible account. Creation just happened. This, this would have been the first thing ever to die. And Adam and Eve are watching this innocent animal go through the pangs of dying. And they're thinking to themselves, we're the ones that sinned, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear the animal was dying in their place that right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal and he puts it on their naked bodies. Maybe it still had a little blood on it. They were covered in the blood. 
And so for the rest of their lives, Adam and Eve are wearing the skin of the animal that they watched die in their place. And whenever God sees Adam and Eve, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So Cain and Abel uh, want to worship God. And Cain decides he wants to do an offshoot of the church of the fig leaf. He starts the church of the fruits and the nuts. Cain's is a religion of works. And we know it's works because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake and you'll bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. Sweat is work. So Cain is trying to work his way to heaven. He's doing something like Adam and he put on fig leaves. He, I got to come up with, I know what I'll do. I'll take, right? He's doing, he's, he's putting all of his works on the altar. Did Cain's works make him acceptable to God? No, right? And then Abel trusted in the lamb. And it's this picture. God is on one side. We are on the other side. Our sins separate us from God and the lamb pays for the sin. The lamb takes the judgment instead of us taking the judgment. And so Abel trusted in the lamb. When Noah got off the ark, he sacrificed lambs. He brought two of every animal, but seven pair of every clean animal. All right, so he had lambs to sacrifice, and then the rainbow appeared. Abraham sacrificed lambs. Moses had every family in Israel kill a lamb and put the blood over the doorposts of their house. Why? Well, here's the angel of death coming to bring judgment. And the blood is there saying the judgment's already been paid for this house. Here's the proof of it. Here's the blood of the animal that, that was judged in our place. You can pass over. You have the tabernacle in the wilderness, right? The tent, has got the holy place, and then the holy of holies. And inside the holy of holies is the Ark of the Covenant. It's a box covered with gold inside of the Ten Commandments. There's a lid, and then on top of the lid are two golden angels. And in between is the presence of the Lord. And so you see the presence of the Lord looking down at the Ten Commandments, and here comes the high priest. And he sprinkles the blood on the lid. It's called the mercy seat. Saying, yeah, we broke the law, but this blood, the, the lamb, took the judgment. And so if the high priest would have gone in there without the blood, he would have been approaching the judgment seat of God. But he's bringing the blood, and he sprinkles it. The, the blood changed it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. When you approach God with the blood of the lamb, you're approaching mercy. Th Solomon had a thousand lambs sacrificed when he dedicated the temple. Finally, John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So God is on one side. We are on the other side. Our sins separate us from God. And the lamb pays for the sin. The lamb took the judgment instead of us taking the judgment. It's just the lamb. Abel didn't put a handful of barley on the corner of the altar. No, it's just the lamb. It's not Jesus and then you do the... No, it's Jesus. You're trusting in Jesus. So I ask people, are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you're still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you are approaching God as Cain. I hope I'm good enough. I uh, hope I piled enough good works. Maybe if I do a couple more things, a couple more handfuls of barley, <laughs> well, that'll do it. Or are you approaching God as Abel? It's not me being good enough. It's this lamb that was good enough to take the judgment in my place. Now, why did the lamb have to die? God's just. He cannot help it. He's just. He's a God of laws. Everything he makes is laws. Laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, laws of physics, laws of optics, law, law, laws of gravity. He's a God of laws, and he has laws for human behavior. We just have the choice as to whether or not to follow the laws, but he's a God of laws, which means he has to judge every sin. Because if he does not judge a sin, by default, his silence would be giving consent to the sin. Like in a wedding ceremony, if you're silent, you're giving consent to the wedding vows. If there's sins and God is silent, not judging the sin, by default, the science will be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. And he cannot deny himself. So he has to judge every sin. Right? So he can never be loved back. Because if he creates us as free will beings that can love him, 
All right? He gives us opportunities. To, but if we step out of line, he has to judge us because if he doesn't judge our sin, his silence will be giving consent to the sin. If he gives consent to sin, he's denying himself and he can't deny himself so he can never be loved back until he came up with a plan. He actually had the plan before he created anything and the plan was his own son would become the lamb, would become a man and die on the cross. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing Love, How Could It Be That Thou, My God, Shouldst Die For Me? So God is just and that he judges every sin, but he's loved and that he provides the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah. Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice. But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. I'm trusting God will have the ram up in the bush, but the other meaning is God will provide himself the sacrifice. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. It says, if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The apostle Paul called it the mystery of the gospel. In this hidden plan, Jesus became man, became the lamb of God, took the wrath of a just God upon himself on the cross in our place, died, rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. The lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. It's his plan. He came up with it before the foundation of the world. He came up with it. He's a just God. He has to judge. He has to judge. He has to judge. But he's a loving God that he provided the lamb to take the judgment. So, that's, so the lamb is our way to approach God, to have a relationship with God without having to worry about being judged by God, right? So he can love you for the rest of eternity. You can love him back for the rest of eternity and not have to worry about being judged by him because all the judgment you deserve went on Christ and he, Jesus took the judgment in our place. And then God fills you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. You read the, after Jesus rose from the dead, he says, it's expedient that I go so that I can send the Holy Spirit. It's like, Jesus, you're right here with us. Don't go. It's like, no, no, no. You don't understand. It's so important. I have to go because I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of us and loves God the Father through us. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, what came out of their mouth? Praises to God. So forever you have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They've existed forever, and they love each other. And so where do we fit in all this? We're filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is loving Jesus and the Father through us. We're, we're now part of this love triangle between God the Father and the Holy Spirit. We're, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, and so he fills us with the Holy Spirit so we can share the love of God with a hurting world. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, rescue those unjustly sentenced to death. Teach the, the, the nursery and the children's church and the junior high and the children. We, you know, everything that's alive takes in and gives out, right? So we, he doesn't want us to just hear a message. He wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit and then use us to share his love, to get involved, to let it flow. And, and there's a million different, however many people there are on the earth, is a, all the different ways the Holy Spirit wants to use you in a unique way to reach people with his love in a way that nobody else can. So today, the God who created everything created you and he wants your love, but he'll never force you because the moment he would force you, he himself would know he's forcing you and he would know that your response is not a love response. For love to be love, it must be voluntary. So the God that created everything wants you to love him back. He made a way for you to love him without, ha without being judged by him. It's called his son, the Lamb of God. So God created everything, drew you here today so that you could hear of his infinite love for you and how he made a way for you to love him back and not have to worry about being judged by him. So let's bow our heads. I'm going to ask pastor to come and let's have a prayer. And just say this prayer under your breath. Heavenly Father, thank you for creating everything. You are so awesome. Thank you for creating me out of nothing. But I have sinned against you. I deserve judgment. 
Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross and take the judgment I deserve upon himself. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross, you were buried, and you rose from the dead, and I am risen with you. I am yours. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, live through me. Love the Father and Jesus through me. Love other people made in God's image through me. I am yours. Amen. Amen. Wow. Would you stand now? Can I bless you as you go out? Bill Feder? thank you so much for what you're doing. Some of your guys are going, what happened, right? It was a lot, and he is a lot. And he's, but one thing I will say in the, in the a lot is the same way he has knowledge is the same way he loves. So if you can, go sit down there, talk to you. Did you see how we, when Eric walked up, he remembered his name? He will ask you because that's what a man of God does. He loves people. And he's a gift to us. His information, the things that he shared is something that we should cherish. Get educated. That's the one thing I will say that, I, that I'm shocked in in all my years of Christianity. And I mean this in the most sincere amount of love. The lack of education that we have. I know there's a lot of you there are Jewish people who know what I'm talking about. Christians were not educated. There's books that he's written that he knows about. There are people that, that, are, that are so many resources now that we have that we should, be, we should understand things more than we ever have. I love the Bible. It's changed my life. Hear me out. But there are so many things that have been a part of that that we don't know about that we're taught, that we're not taught. And I want you to be a part of learning those things because those things help to shape our great country. And we've forgotten about them. We've forgotten about them. We have forgotten about them. Many of you don't even know them because I didn't. And I've been a Christian for 30 years now. 30. And I was never taught them. So I want to encourage you, please go. Give, get some of the books from my brother. He loves you. Talk with you. And ask him anything. He'll tell you if he doesn't know. But he's a wealth of information. So as the Lord goes forward and we go forward in this day, Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the heat. Yay, it's back. Yay. I like the heat. I'm sorry. I hate being cold. My back doesn't work. I like being hot. That's just me. Kobe, she's like, ah. anyways, I love, the, I love the heat. I can't stand being cold. The Lord bless you and keep you, huh? May he make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord always continually know that he loves you that the mercy of God is upon you, that Jesus came down from heaven for all of us, and he would have came down for you. May we walk today full of power, understanding, and love. May we know that we have been spoken to about God and that we are wonderfully created. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And you need any prayer? Amen.